Hi everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Amy Frank and I'm doing a demo today. This demo might be a bit different than other demos you've seen. And I've only done three demos before, and the first two were on Saturday, one was on Monday, and you guys are right for it. So um, it's been a lot of a week from zero to four in a week. Um, okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm an artist here in Victoria, and through my art, I do mental health advocacy. In 2004, at the age of 18, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder after a heavy struggle with self-harm, suicidal tendencies, and substance abuse. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what bipolar disorder is, it's a mental illness categorized as a mood disorder. Its symptoms are manic or hypomanic highs that swing to devastating or suicidal lows. It is also known as manic depression. I have been creating art since I could pick up a crayon. As a youth, I was taught to draw realistically, or another way I like to phrase it, is I was taught to draw the world exactly as I saw it before me. When I started showing symptoms of mental illness in my teenage years, my art began to shift into surrealism, because the world I saw in front of me was rapidly becoming distorted. In this presentation, I will show how my work has evolved on my journey into what I am creating today. I've titled my demo, The Art of Mental Wellness, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the story of a study I came across a while ago on rats and addiction. Some of you may have heard of it. The study struck a chord with me as addiction is something I've struggled with throughout my life. In this study, they placed a single rat in an empty cage, and they offered it regular water or water laced with hard drugs. Every time they did this, the rat drank the drug-laced water until it died. This became our theory of addiction, that once you try a hard drug, you will go back to it until it cripples you, destroys your life, or kills you. A while later, in the 1970s, a different researcher named Bruce K. Alexander came along. Is this really it, an accurate portrayal of addiction, he thought? You put a rat in an empty cage. It has nothing to do but drink the laced water. Bruce K. Alexander and his colleagues at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada, decided to build a rat park. The park had everything a rat could want. <clears throat> Yummy food, tons of other rats to be friends with and mate with, toys, and lots of space to run around and play. They gave the rats the choice again of choosing regular water or water laced with hard drugs. In the new study, the rats would try the drug laced water, but they wouldn't go back to it. The findings in the study were that addiction is not a moral failing, and it's not something that takes you over and hijacks your brain. Addiction is largely an adaption to your environment. It has to do with which cage you're in. In my life, I have seen my mental illness as a cage, and honestly, at some points it has been. Mental illness led me to drug abuse, as drugs were a way to cope with my symptoms. As I grow, however, I've come to see that the true cage is not mental illness. The true cage is the stigma and the system that surrounds it. When I think of my childhood, my memories are blurry. I remember lemonade stands and water balloon fights. This was in the early 90s, before everyone had the internet, so my friends and I would put on mini plays for the neighborhood in the summertime to entertain ourselves. I remember loving art and always trying to draw characters from Archie and Marvel comic books. My parents supported my interest in art by placing me into all kinds of art classes and art camps. In these art classes, I learned to draw the world as I saw it before me. I was taught to use graphite, charcoal, and pastels. I had friends and I had good family, but I remember being sad. I was bullied by my peers in elementary school I have an astigmatism in my right eye, so I had to wear a patch over my good eye to try and strengthen the sight of my weak eye. Kids called me a pirate, and eventually when I got glasses, I was called four eyes. So I stopped wearing glasses, and I started to change my appearance. Although being called four eyes may sound harmless, by age 14 I entered junior high school, and the bullying got much worse. As a young teenager, I had close friends at school, 
but I struggled with an unhappiness that no one knew about. I began to self-medicate with alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, and soon I began to self-harm. The bullying got worse when my self-harm became known at school. A certain group of boys would hand me bottles of painkillers and tell me to kill myself because no one wanted me around. These same boys would throw, pen these same boys would throw pennies at me and call me names. I coped with my emotions by writing poetry about magical places, loneliness, and an ever-growing depression. I'm now going to read a short poem I wrote at the age of 14 called Souls. Silent souls, mourn at night, through wanting tears, I feel their fright. Between the hills and valleys vast, these are souls of present and past. These are those and those are these, near and far across the seas, between the headstones, unmarked roads, my quiet tears will softly flow. Water through the skin will seep, my soul is lost in thousands deep. And every step is oh so brave, every step is to my grave. Every sorrow I do know is mixed with those from long ago. Every breath that I take keeps me from my stone grave fate. And every soul around me cries and asks me why I want to die. Although I was a pretty good kid growing up, by age 14 I was labeled as a troublemaker. I now talk back to my parents and teachers. I didn't do my schoolwork, I skipped classes, and I was constantly caught smoking on or near school property getting detentions. I was sick and struggling with emotional pain, but instead of being looked at as sick, I was seen as rebellious. To this day, our culture doesn't understand the crushing pain of emotional and mental illnesses the same way we sympathized and understand with pain from physical illness. I read a quote a while ago by C.S. Lewis that said, it is easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. By age 14, my quote-unquote rebellious nature was strong. I was so unhappy. All I wanted to do was drink, smoke cigarettes, and smoke pot in peace. But I was a teenager with loving and concerned parents. The tension between myself and my desires, and my parents and their desires for me, grew strong. So at age 14, I left home. I couch surfed mostly, going from friend's house to friend's house, and sometimes rarely, I would sleep in parks curled up beneath my jacket. I still attempted to go to school, where I began harder drug use, which led to overpowering suicidal feelings. At the age of 15, I had my first major suicide attempt. A hospital can be a cruel place for the addicts and the mentally ill. There's stigma even amongst doctors and nurses. When I was admitted for suicide attempts and our self-harm in my teens, I was told by a few different physicians that I was wasting their time and taking a hospital bed away from somebody who really needed it. I'm not sure how those doctors can stitch up chunks of flesh slashed out from a wrist or feed someone charcoal so they vomit out the poison they've ingested and think you, you are taking precious space away from the people who really need it. At times like those, I wish I'd lost my arm instead of my mind so that the doctors took me seriously. When I was released from the regular hospital, I had my first of many psychiatric hospitalizations. The first one was at Jack Ledger House, a psychiatric hospital for youth. I spent over a month there, and when I was discharged, I was expelled from my junior high school, being told that I was a disruption to my peers. I was placed into the alternative school system, into a school called GAP, which is an acronym for the Girls Alternative Program. It was a school for pregnant, parenting, and troubled teenage girls. I was in the troubled category. Believe me when I say that going to a school for pregnant, parenting, and troubled girls was not fun for me. The bullying got much, much worse, and eventually I left Gap, and I went to a different alternative school that was co-ed. I continued to write privately in journals, and I started pen and ink doodles in my classes at the alternative school instead of working on schoolwork. This photograph shows some of the many journals I've scrapbooked and written over the years. Most of the art from my teenage years that I'm showing in this slideshow presentation was actually drawn into my journals. This art piece, Conversations with a Mirror, was created to show the impact and consequences of the beauty industry. Every day as a teenager, I painted a mask. Whether it was the physical mask of makeup or forcing a smile when I was crying inside, 
Meanwhile, I felt like I didn't exist. I was the mask I wore, and no one knew the real me. At school, I continued to struggle with severe depression and suicidal thoughts. I found it hard to concentrate on my studies when I honestly didn't know if I'd live long enough to see the next day. Art and writing, alongside self-harm, drugs and alcohol, were how I made the days bearable. It was the only way I knew how to cope. At age 15, I met two influential doctors who my relationships with would impact me to this day. The first doctor I met was a psychologist named Dr. Penny Hobson Underwood. Although I no longer lived at home, my parents were deeply concerned about my well-being, so they hired Penny to counsel me. I am one of the fortunate few whose parents could afford to hire a therapist. The second person I met was my current psychiatrist, Dr. Adam Gunn. I have been working with Dr. Gunn for 17 years now. He, alongside my friends and family, has seen my struggle as well as my growth. I was in the alternative school system for two years. With the help of my psychiatrist, my psychologist, and some other wonderful people I met on my journey, I cleaned up my act, got off the drugs, and eventually returned to the regular school system in hopes of graduating. By this time, I was 17, and I had an apartment I was living in by myself. I enrolled myself into Victoria High School as an independent student, which meant I had no parents to report to. Unfortunately, living on my own was isolating, and my life experiences to this point made me feel distant and separated from my peers at Vic High, which gradually led me back to self-medicating with hard drugs. Although I started off school that year with the best intentions, Soon I was skipping my classes for days and weeks on end. When I showed up, I was almost always late for class. When I was late, I would receive a late slip from the teacher that had to be signed by the principal. Three late slips equal detention. Vic High's principal at the time was a man named Keith Forshaw. When I would be late, I'd stand in the line with all the other tardy students and I'd wait for my slip to be signed. When my turn would come to go into the office, Mr. Forshaw would actually get up out of his chair and come over and shake my hand. Every time I was late, he would do this. And he would say, Amy, I know you're going through a lot. Thank you for being here today. As a youth, I felt like my teachers, principals, and parents held punishments over my head. I got detentions, groundings, and expulsion. I never did receive a detention from Mr. Forshaw. He simply thanked me every time for making the effort to show up. Unfortunately, even with the rare kindness of Mr. Forshaw and some of the teachers at Vic High, and with the aid of my therapist and psychiatrist, my drug use and depression still prevailed, and I dropped out of high school. Because of the drugs, I began to experience drug psychosis. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term psychosis, it means psychotic, which refers to hallucinations and delusions. A hallucination is to hear, smell, see, or feel something with your bodily senses that isn't there, like a person who hallucinates might experience hearing voices. A delusion is a false belief held with absolute conviction despite superior evidence, like that walking into traffic won't harm you because you're invincible, when obviously it will. In my psychosis, I thought ghosts and spirits were haunting me. Within a year and a bit of living alone, attempting to go to Vic High, my use of hard drugs eventually got me locked out of the apartment I'd been living in. I was forced to return to my parents' home on the condition that I could live in their basement suite. Because of the depression and psychosis, I couldn't function in society, but life cost money and I was now 18, so I applied and eventually received disability status with the ministry. That year, at age 18, I checked myself into a psychiatric hospital for adults, Eric Martin Pavilion, due to suicidal thoughts. That was my last psychiatric admittance, to this day, where I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Once discharged from Eric Martin, the depression consumed me. I stopped doing art, and I stopped writing. My parents saw my emotional collapse. They never demanded that I look for work but requested that while I lived in their suite, that I try to volunteer. 
At age 19 and 20, although my mental health was poor, I volunteered with the Beachnell Petting Zoo, working with the animals act as therapy. I was ashamed though. I didn't tell anyone about my diagnosis or my past. A year later, I began a volunteer position with high-risk youth on the streets of Victoria. It was a program created by the Youth Empowerment Society. I only lasted a few weeks in my position there. Working with the troubled youth was too close to home. And although I was now clean from hard drugs, I still struggled with alcoholism and my mental health. I decided after that that I still wanted to have an impact on youth, so I registered myself to be a Girl Guide Leader. I was a Girl Guide Leader for six years, from age 22 to 27. I loved it, but my past haunted me, and I was fearful that if anyone knew I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder or knew about my former drug use, that I would be told I was not fit to work with children. In my first year of being a Girl Guide Leader, I so badly didn't want to carry the burden of secrecy that I was carrying, that then, at age 22, I purchased the website domain amyfrank.ca. I built my first website myself on a template program from Macintosh called iWeb. My first website was called The Mind of Amy Frank. This illustration, The Mind of Amy Frank, represents the two contrasting sides of bipolar disorder. On the left, there is a snake, fire, and a gun against a woman's head, while on the right, there is a snowy forest captured in moonlight with a cougar in the foreground. Cougars often appeared in my nighttime dreams back then as a spiritual guide and protector. They were a symbol of resilience and hope. My first website, like my current website, featured my art from being a teenager, my story so far, and my writing. I've actually built every website to this day by myself from different template programs I've come across over the years. Although I was clean from drugs, despite volunteering, I continued to struggle heavily with alcoholism, depression, and suicidal thoughts. With my new website and social media, I began to post my writing and art online. I'm now going to read a short poem I wrote at the age of 23 called This Is Me. This is me when I'm suicidal. This is me with a broken finger because I beat myself over the head with a flashlight in a drunken rage. This is me smiling. This is me hiding the slash marks down my thighs. This is me with a broken heart. This is me with a drinking problem. This is me when I'm suicidal and I look pretty normal, don't I? In 2010, at the age of 24, I had very little going for me. I had no education, and because I fell ill when I was so young, I had no real work experience. Through mental health, I met an education coach who encouraged me to go back to school. He encouraged me to take the best program at Camosun College, which is an acronym for Building Employment Strategies and Techniques. The best program? The BEST program is basically a program to take if you don't know what you're doing in life. Through it, I discovered I had a passion for science. I discovered in my early 20s that I have a love-hate relationship with insects. I absolutely, I absolutely do not like creepy crawlies, and that alone makes me curious about them. They are so small, and most are actually quite harmless, so why am I so afraid? My least favorite insect at the time was an earwig. So I started researching them online, and I discovered how to tell a male apart from a female by their pincers. Entomology is the study of insects, but to go into that specific area, I had to start by going into environmental sciences. So, as my final project for the course, I shadowed the environmental sciences program at Camosun College. For one whole day, I went to labs and lectures to see what a typical school day was like. Amazingly, I graduated from the BEST program. It was the first time I graduated from any education-based program. I actually started getting into public speaking because of the BEST program. Since 2016, they've been inviting me back as a guest speaker to their graduating classes. Unfortunately for me, after I graduated the BEST program in 2010, to go into the environmental sciences program at Camosun, I needed to upgrade my high school and get my GED. I tried to upgrade, but eventually I stopped. I struggled with learning at school. There is a quote 
from Einstein that says, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. That was me. I was a rat in an empty cage with my mental illness and addictions, and a fish being taught to climb trees in the education system. Don't get me wrong, education is very important. I would never ever encourage someone to drop out of school or not graduate high school. Believe me when I say, not having a high school education makes life a lot harder. But for me, I don't learn the way schools teach. So I dropped out of upgrading, and I went back to drinking, and I felt like a hopeless failure. One year later, in 2011, when I was 25, my life changed. I got into a relationship for four years, from 2011 to 2015, that would be a source of growth and strength. I am no longer in that particular, sorry. I'm no longer in that particular relationship, and I don't believe that relationships should be sought out as salvation. But this relationship opened my eyes to opportunities that I hadn't thought of before. It was a changing point in my life. Although I dabbled with art in my early 20s, in 2011, I started drawing again full time. I started with black and white trees filled with complex patterns. I discovered later that these patterns were actually a spin-off from the art style to entangle. With the encouragement of my boyfriend at the time, in 2011, I officially turned my art into a business. My art continued to evolve. I went from black and white trees to drawing animals. I began to mix the black and white patterns in next to the colors and shapes of the animals. I did this because I would get so overstimulated when playing with composition and color that I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't want to take bathroom breaks. I would just want to work for hours and hours and hours on end, which wasn't good for my mental health. I started incorporating the patterns because they eased me. They would take my creative mind from mania to a calm, repetitive motion, pattern after pattern. Mixing patterns into my work has become my trademark art, art style. My style may be admired by some and disliked by others, but to me, it is my therapy. In 2013, at age 27, two years after starting my business, I felt stuck. I didn't know anything about art as a business. All I knew was that I loved creating and that people were interested in buying my work. I decided to look back into schooling. The same education coach who found the best program for me was also an artist as a side passion slash career. He admired my work and in 2013 he, applied, he helped me apply to get funding to pay for a course at the Vancouver Island School of Art called Professional Development. It was a course on how to become a professional artist. I learned a lot in it, but I hated it. I have issues around school and I struggled with the course, but I completed it. In 2015, age 29, again, I'd taken my art business as far as I could on my own. I was now in some retail outlets, I'd been juried into the Moss Street Painted, and I'd been accepted into a wonderful organization of people called the Island Illustrator Society. But again, I was stuck. In the late spring and summer of 2015, at age 29, I applied for a business course that was funded by the government called Youth Mean Business. The course was for young entrepreneurs aged 18 to 29. They offered $5,000 in funding to complete the course. To complete the course, I had to write a viable business plan and present it in front of a panel of local successful entrepreneurs. Through the program, I received a volunteer mentor who continues to mentor and support me as a friend to this day. I also worked with a business coach. In the program, I learned about branding, marketing, who's my target market, bookkeeping, business lingo like gross versus net, as I had no idea at the time what that meant, amongst many other things. I struggled with the course and the business plan because I struggled learning at school. I pushed through though and succeeded in completing the course. Not only did I write a 27 page business plan, but I aced my panel presentation. By the end of 2015, although my emotional mood swings were in check, my physical health was rapidly declining. 
I had gained 80 pounds in a little over two years as I was now turning to food as a coping technique for my anxiety. I also had an extremely sedentary lifestyle. I didn't exercise, I didn't stretch, and the anxiety was so bad that I rarely left my home. Two years later, in January of 2018, despite the, my, despite the fact that my physical health was now at its worst, I decided I wanted to go back to art school. Although in my youth, I had done many art classes and courses which taught me the basics of drawing, I was self-taught as a teenager to use pens and colored pencils in my work because those were the tools I had readily available at school. As a youth, when I was 14 years old, I had an amazing art teacher named Joan Hill. I decided I would look Joan up 17 years later to see if she was still teaching in Victoria, and she was. I emailed her out of the blue, told her who I was, and I signed up for art classes with her again. In those art classes, Joan taught me to use watercolor pencils in a different way than I had already been using them. In August of last year, after art school ended, I decided to attend Q College to learn more about business. At Q College, I learned more about branding, marketing, content writing, social media, and a brief course on InDesign and Photoshop, as I had never done digital manipulations or digital art uh, before. I messed that up, sorry. <laughs> as I was attending Q College in the summer and fall of 2018, my life in art began to shift again. 2018 was what I refer to as the year from hell. I actually just took November and December off from my art business as I was on the brink of a mental breakdown. Life threw many curveballs at me in 2018, some of which were in my control to change, but many of which were not. The overwhelming amount of life-impacting changes that happened in 2018 should have broken me. I wish I could tell you why my life became so overwhelming, but although certain life events affected me greatly, they are not my stories to share here with you today. From September 2015 until now, I have spent over three years of my life hand in hand with the most inspiring and supportive man, Dave Wilson, the author of a book series called Brock and Kara. Through Dave, I learned about the Human Microbiome Project, which was set up in 2008 to explore the impact our gut has on our health. Gut health, which explores microbes, is an actual area of science with more and more studies coming out of how our gut microbes play a role in our mental, emotional, and physical health. In January of 2018, I weighed 208 pounds. I had suffered from constant fatigue for years, and now I was experiencing nausea and vomiting, although I wasn't pregnant. I had heartburn, diarrhea or constipation, stomach aches, migraine headaches, and overall body pains. Because this had been going on for a while, I had seen my family doctor about my poor physical health and extremely low energy many times. The blood work and other medical tests always came back as fine, so my family doctor summed up all my symptoms as anxiety. In mid-2018, due to my new knowledge in gut health from Dave, I sought out a naturopath for the first time, Dr. Stephanie Bayless, as I was so tired of Western medicine either telling me nothing was wrong or offering me their pharmaceutical solution. To be honest, the reason I'm shaking today is partly the anxiety of this demo, but mostly because one of my mood stabilizers gave me Parkinsonism, which is a drug-induced side effect that mimics the symptoms of Parkinson's. This side effect can become permanent, so Dr. Gunn, my psychiatrist, has slowly been weeding me off of that mood stabilizer. Because I've been in the mental health system for over half my life, I've had a lot of experience with medications and their side effects. I find it increasingly frustrating that therapy and alternative medicine are not covered in mental health. They cost money out of your pocket in the hundreds if not thousands of dollars, while drugs are free. Although I believe medications have a place, I also believe there's a lot more to mental, physical, and emotional wellness than pharmaceuticals can provide. By October of 2018, I was drowning in the overwhelming life circumstances that kept hitting the fan. I took November and December off work as I was fearful that a suicidal depression would consume me and that I would have to commit myself to the hospital for the first time in 14 years. But the depression never came. Every year I suffer from seasonal depression and this year amongst all the stress 
During the dark hours of fall and winter, I remain completely sober without a single mental health relapse and without any medication changes or increases. But why? Why did I do so well when the circumstances I was facing would have drowned anyone, let alone someone prone to depression? I've titled my presentation, The Art of Mental Wellness, because just like the rats in the story I told at the beginning, I believe people need to live in park-like environments if they want to thrive. When I came out from drugs in my early 20s, I had to change everything. I left all my friends as I knew that the only way I could truly clean up was to change my entire environment. In 2018, I realized I had to change my environment again. Only this time, due to my knowledge of microbes and gut health, I knew I had to change both my external and my internal environment. On top of my medications and therapy, I began to analyze and change these four vital areas of my life. Sleep, food, movement, and connection. Connection with others, yourself, animals, nature, and your higher power, if you believe in one. Sleep is when our bodies, minds, and emotions recharge. If we don't sleep well, every aspect of our lives will be impacted. Fortunately for me, my medications knock me out at night, so I do sleep well. That's the first thing I had going for me. I changed my perception on food and started eating foods that are nutrient dense so they can fuel, build, and maintain my body. When I slowly started changing my diet, I came to some pretty profound realizations. The first was that I literally am what I eat. What I consume builds every physical aspect of my body. It affects my hair, my nails, my skin, and my organs, but it doesn't stop there. It also affects my emotions. My next huge realization was that sugar is actually a drug. It gives me a high and then I crash, driving me to want to consume more sugar. It is the most socially accepted drug on the planet. When I removed refined sugars from my diet, I realized the true impact that food can have on my mood. I also cut out processed foods. All I eat at home now are meat and veggies. Once I began to count nutrients, instead of counting calories, I started to consume foods that gave me energy so I could move my body. I've lost 40 pounds since January 2018, and a huge part of that was just changing what I eat. But, believe it or not, losing weight was not my goal. I decided to change my diet because I was tired of feeling lethargic, mood swinging, and physically unwell all the time. I had no options left. I was tired of being sick and tired, and I was tired of Western medicine, either offering me medications as a band-aid solution, or telling me that nothing was wrong. I was ready to take every step I could towards mental, emotional, and physical wellness. At the beginning of 2018, I felt like I had no real friends to connect with. Throughout 2018, I worked on widening my social network. I began reaching out to connect with old friends, current friends, and strangers who have now become friends. As an introvert, the largest and most impactful aspect of connection that I created in 2018 was with myself. In my two months off work, I had a time of self-reflection on what I wanted in life. As of January 1st, 2019, I quit smoking cigarettes. As amongst many other realizations, I realized that smoking was not in line with what I wanted most, which is to be well, because I have been sick for a very long time. Lastly, in 2018, I reconnected with what I call the universe, also known as God, Allah, Higher Power, the Source, or the Creator, amongst many other names. I am not religious but I found that believing in something greater than myself is essential to my life. Whether there is or not, for me, believing there is meaning and a greater purpose behind my worldly experience makes the dark days a lot more bearable. When I started focusing on these four areas, my life started to dramatically improve, even though the circumstances around me continued to get worse and worse. On top of my medications, therapy, and alternative medicine, Changing what I eat, which is my internal environment, and making different lifestyle choices, which is my external environment, help build the park-like environment that I needed to thrive.
Today, I am 32 years old, which is pretty amazing, as I never thought I'd live long enough to see my 20s, let alone be standing here at 32. Today, I am clean and sober. I still struggle with my physical health, although it actually is improving. But most importantly, I'm emotionally stable. I have been self-employed in the art business since I was 25 in 2011. I've been somewhat successful in my career as an artist so far. I've been juried into shows and events like the Moss Street Painting and the Souk and Sydney Fine Art Show. I receive commissions so people hire me to do the art they want. My greeting cards are in retail locations around Victoria. I was featured in Focus Magazine with my art on the cover and a wonderful article written, in, written about me inside. I have a licensing contract with the Jigsaw Puzzle Company, Standout Puzzles. But most importantly, I advocate for mental health awareness. I do this through my personal website, through card or product descriptions, and through public speaking and talking at events. Before I wrap up my talk, I feel that it's important to state that everyone who's been diagnosed with mental illness experiences it differently. And let's be honest, there are varying types and degrees of mental illness. I've spoken about addiction a lot, as it can be a big problem with people who are prone to mental illness. That being said, not everyone who's quote unquote mentally ill becomes a drug addict. I was, but addiction also comes in many other forms. We know drugs, cigarettes, or alcohol can be addictive, but people can also be addicted to food, gambling, sex, work, video games, their smartphone slash technology in general, or shopping, to name a few. This presentation today has been my story alongside the evolution of my art. But really, this is a story. It is my interpretation of events. All day I, and all of us, tell ourselves stories. They are the thoughts in our minds that speak to us all day. Sometimes the thoughts bring smiles, sometimes fear or hope or anger, or sometimes they just bring numbness. When I do my art, I try to step away from the stories my thoughts tell me. I try to let everything go, the anxiety, the darkness, and the joy, and I live in the moment of what I am doing, stroke after stroke, with my pencils and pen. When I do my art as a mindful meditation, I become aware of my stories. I can step outside them, observe how they enter my mind, but I don't entertain them. For me, this is the art of mental wellness. Once I am aware that my thoughts are stories, I can stop the thoughts in their trap, and I can change them. This is known as cognitive behavioral therapy. And it, although it's not always easy to catch thoughts, it's an extremely powerful tool. I thank all of you for being here with me today. To any of you who might be struggling in your own lives, I have one thing to say. You, you have survived your entire life up until this moment. You have survived trauma, heartache, and devastation. And yet here you are. Please keep going. That is the end of my presentation. You can get up and stretch or ask questions as I get myself organized. But I'm still shaking.